Shabbat Shalom. Welcome. Welcome to Congregation Yeshua Tzion. Let's open in prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of your Shabbat. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam. Baruch atah Adonai ha'el ha'kadosh. Praised are you, Adonai, holy God. Baruch atah Adonai shemaya tafila. Praised are you, Adonai, who hears prayer. Lord, we thank you that when we cry out to you, you hear, and you answer, hallelujah. He who dwells in the shelter of El Yon will abide in the shadow of El Shaddai. I will say of Adonai, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will rescue you from the hunter's trap and from the death, deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is body armor and shield. Lord, we thank you that you are a shield around us. Quiet our hearts so we might enter into worship today. Thank you so much for the privilege to come together in your presence. We thank you for this place, Lord, that you've been so faithful to let us meet here. And we thank you so much for our new place. Shame Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Shabbat Shalom. <clears throat> Today we are looking at the third portion of Leviticus. Last week we took a break from the normal Torah cycle to have a special reading for Shabbat Chol HaMoed. And now we resume back in Leviticus with the third portion, which is the 26th portion overall, if you're keeping track or like to keep track of those kinds of things. So we're just about to halfway if you're counting all 54 portions. Um, as we come to this section, this is a difficult section and a very blessed section when you read portions of this. Um, the portion is called Shemini and means eighth, and it's from one of the first words in the text. Now, in the text, um, this starts in Leviticus chapter 9 and goes all the way through Leviticus chapter 11, verse 47. Um, it covers a number of things. There's some historical narrative in the first two chapters, and then we have some instruction, the beginning, in fact, of the instruction of the laws of what are considered purity. And these laws will continue all the way up until we get to about Leviticus 21, where the shift changes from the laws of purity, speaking directly to the priests. If you missed the first uh, seven chapters of Leviticus, it's been talking about the different sacrifices, and then in chapter 8, it talks about the inaugural ceremony that Aaron and his sons were to go through and how they were to be anointed. And then in chapter 9, where we resume this week, we see that uh, inauguration taking place between Aaron and his four sons, Nadab, Avihu, Eleazar, Itamar. And so each of these four sons of Aaron were also anointed and put on, uh, were put on special garments as well. At the end of chapter 9, something very interesting happens. We see that God affirms by allowing his glory to come upon the people. This is where the second Aliyah begins. And the fire falls and consumes the offering, and the people's response is to worship. But there's a greater truth in this. And it's simply this, if God 
wants to affirm something, he can. I want to say that again. If God wants to affirm something, he knows how to do that. And so sometimes a lot of people are saying, how do I know that I'm hearing the Lord? How do I know that I'm following and doing the right things? And the simple answer is, you can pray and ask for confirmation. And that's exactly what God does. He shows his blessing. We see Aaron blessing the people, and then God's glory appearing, and the fire of God coming upon the altar to consume the offerings. It was quite a momentous event, and as you read in verse 24, it said the people bowed down and worshipped as a response to that. And worship is such an important part of what God wants to do in our lives that we should also be moved to worship, be moved to praise him when good things happen for us. And we know that he's confirming what's going on in our life. Amen? Amen. So it's an important aspect of our life of faith to know that we have God's smile, that we have God's purpose being fulfilled. Now, with that also comes a test. Because right on the, right on the very moments of this, Aaron's two sons come forth and they put strange fire before the Lord and they are consumed and killed. And it's a difficult section because we don't hear much from Aaron. We don't hear much why. And there's lots of questions. Everybody has all kinds of wonderful answers that it might be. But basically, they just came at the wrong time. The timing was wrong. That's why timing is so important many times in our life, that we don't understand, we're praying, we're hurting, and we want answers now. But God has a timing for when things are to happen. God has a timing of when things come about. And sometimes our and, you know, desire is to make it happen ourselves. Rabbi Haim used to always refer to this as the, the practical atheist. That we're saved, and we know we're saved, but we still act like we can do what we want. And if God doesn't handle this, by golly, I'm going to take hold of the car and steer it for him. And that's not a good idea, as we see Aaron's sons making a plea to do. All we know is that it was the wrong timing. And this also coincides with the Haftar portion, which is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 6, where we see a great time of blessing, but we also see something happening that is very sad and ugly, where we see Uzzah dying because maybe he, uh, they put the ark on a cart, and it's a new cart because it was brought back to them on a cart from the Philistines. And unfortunately, the ox stumble, and Uzzah puts his hand forth and dies. And it's kind of one of those things. And where Aaron is silent in the Torah, David understands that this is a big event, that they've done something that is out of God's will, that is out of God's bounds. And he understands, and he even takes the time to say, maybe this wasn't something I should have been doing. And so it's a very important section as well. I like to also coincide at passages of the New Testament that also occur similar events. And one of the most similar events I can point to is in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5. Now it's a little bit different, but it's kind of the same. Because what happens in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5, we have a great blessing coming about on the heels of persecution. The uh, apostles, the emissaries, the shlachim, however you want to refer to them, they are in Jerusalem, they're preaching before the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin beats them and says, stop doing this, stop preaching Yeshua. And they leave the situation and they go back with their fellow disciples and they celebrate. They celebrate the fact that they understood that the persecution was confirmation that God was doing his work, and they pray, Lord, make us more bold. Make us 
able to speak your word even more. And it says where they were that the place was shaken. Similar to the Torah portion. That something happened that was quite extraordinary. And then on the heels of that, we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Where we have two disciples that just died because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And it, it, it kind of fits in a little bit with the Torah portion because these events are very similar in the fact that it made people think and consider. And what it really comes down to is we serve a holy God. And that's not a, uh, maybe a thing that everyone understands or always grasps, but God is very holy. And because of that, as it says in the portion itself, imitate him. Be holy yourself. If I am holy, you are to be holy as well. And that's one of the most highest forms of things we can ever do, is imitate God by doing what he does. If he's holy, we're to be holy. If he follows a certain pattern, we follow the certain pattern as well. Now, the section I wanted to focus on is another difficult section, Nobody really understands fully what happened, but we know Aaron is a little bit sad, and I'm sure Eleazar and Itamar were also very sad at the death of their two brothers, Aaron's sons. In fact, it's an interesting concept. We have, a, we have names for people. We have orphans. There are people that have lost their parents. We have widows. That's someone who's lost their husband, the widower someone who's lost their wife, but there's no really name for someone who loses children. It's an interesting thought. Someone who has children actually die, and it's very sad. It's very sad because there's not a way to define it. There's not a way to understand it. And Aaron didn't lose all of his family, but it was still a very strong pain, and in the sense, Moses gets angry with him. And I'm kind of like, gee, Moses, hasn't this guy had enough? He just lost his two sons, and you're kind of getting upset with him? And he doesn't really make his focus with Aaron, but he turns on the remaining sons and says, why didn't you eat the sin offering in the holy place? And it goes back to the idea of why, when certain offerings were given, there were portions for the priests, there were portions for the people, and the sin offering... It was not all burned on the altar. It was taken outside the camp to be burned. A very important concept because it tells us in the book of Hebrews we're to go outside the camp where Messiah was as well. And there's that whole concept of because he was a sin offering, that didn't mean he was fully consumed on the altar. And it's the same picture that's talked about. But there was a portion the priests were to eat and they were supposed to go and eat it in the holy place. And what ends up happening is it ends up getting burned up on the altar. And that's why Moses gets a little bit upset. But Aaron, in turn, answers for his sons and says, this was our offering. Would it have been accepted knowing all these things that were coming upon us now? And Moses heard it and he held his peace. And it's one area of scripture that I didn't un totally understand until I looked at it again and again. And that's the beauty of scripture. When you don't understand things, it's good that you struggle with it. It's good that you keep looking for answers. It's good that you keep reading it and looking for what you don't see in the immediate sense of what's going on. Scripture has a funny way of doing that. Now, scripture goes into the end in the last chapter talking about things that we can eat. Now, no one likes to hear those things. You can eat this, but you can't eat that. These are the kind of things where God is really getting up close and personal. And at times, the thing I've always told people is, Romans 14 is the standard by which we as a congregation walk and live out our faith in this area. But it's also important to know that God expects people to grow. And what that means is, the more years, the more time you have with God, hopefully you're farther in your relationship with him, your love relationship, that you go farther with him, 
than you were a year or two ago. And even though people look at these things, I really sobered up again this week because I had to remember that there were people that were willing to die for these things. People during the time of Maccabees were willing to die than eat pork or to eat shellfish or eat whatever that was unclean. And I can say that's not where my faith would sometimes take me. I would just eat the pork or the shellfish and not worry about it. But there were people that were willing to do that kind of faith. They were willing to not compromise. They were willing to see that their life and the appetites that they find in their life were not about them, but about God. So, Lord, we thank you for this portion of Scripture. We thank you as we enter the section of holiness. And I pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself as people continue reading these next few sections that talk about being holy and talk about being pure. You desire for all of us to have a pure walk with you. You desire all of us to know how to approach you. And most important, Lord, you want to affirm and confirm the things that we already know so that we have confidence, so that we can come to you with joy. And in your presence, we find the fullness of your joy, Lord. We thank you for this portion in Yeshua's name. Amen. Of what Yvonne's been able to do over the years with, with first by herself and then by bringing people on has been fantastic. And uh, it's a really good example, too. We always like to say that a ministry develops when a, a, a leader develops or someone has a passion develops and takes ownership. And that's definitely what, what happened with, with Yvonne. And not just that, but it's, it's that when maybe your time is up or you're done with, with that ministry, it's not a matter, okay, Joy, here's the thing. You know, people just hand it back to Joy or Haim or me or Michael. And that's very annoying. And it's not annoying. It's not just annoying. It's just sad. It's just sad because it realizes that it's just what you want to see things uh, move on. And that's what's happened recently with, uh, with Yvonne kind of uh, sort of handing things off to the next person I'm going to invite up, which is Deborah Brown. To, I'm going to pass the baton to you. Hopefully I didn't steal any thunder from you. you, can, you you've got a lot of thunder from what I heard Kent told me about the thunder. But he's not here, so here, please. Well, y Yvonne is a great teacher, and I'm a slow learner. I'll need lots of hesed. <laughs> Yvonne, come on up, dear. It's been a pleasure for me to be here. And I really miss you guys when I'm not here. And I love you so much. Okay. Right. Okay. We'll what else? Do you have anything else you were going to say? Lord, we just thank you for Yvonne. We thank you for this example, for this model, Lord. Uh, it's not about Yvonne. It's about what you've done through someone who's willing, who's willing to to take you on faith and to step out on faith. And so we thank you for her and just pray for her continued health and well-being and shalom, uh, Lord, from this point forward. And we ask this and say this, speak this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> and I want you to know that Deborah is doing a, a magnificent job yeah. with, <laughs> with the care ministry. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Okay, so I'll be reading from the Tree of Life version of the Bible, Psalm 139. Ah, for the music director, a Psalm of David. Adonai, you searched me and know me. Whenever I sit down or stand up, you know it. You discern my thinking from afar. You observe my journeying and my resting, and you are familiar with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, Behold, Adonai, you know all about it. You hemmed me in, behind, and before, and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. 
Where can I go from your ruach? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, look, you are there too. If I take the wings of the dawn and settle on the other side of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely darkness covers me, night keeps light at a distance from me, even darkness is not dark for you, and night is as bright as day, darkness and light are alike. For you have created my conscience, you knit me together in my mother's womb, I praise you, for I am awesomely, wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows that very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was unformed, and in your book were written the days that I was, were formed, when not one of them had come to be. How precious are your thoughts, O God! How great is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O God. Away from me, you bloody men, for they speak about you with wicked intent. Your enemies reproach you in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, Adonai? Do I not loathe those who rise against you? I hate them with total hatred. I consider them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Examine me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any offensive way within me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Shabbat shalom. I told Rabbi David this morning that I had a dream last night <laughs> that um, there was a special speaker just before the message who was supposed to have 10 minutes. And after 40 minutes, I texted uh, Rabbi David and said, should I preach next week? <laughs> His response was, oh. <laughs> so anyways, we made it. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your presence here. We're just really overwhelmed by who you are and what you do and how much you know us and how much you love us and just the way we are. So, Lord, as we look at your word today, speak to us. Open our eyes, open our ears, and just have your own way. And we pray this, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. It's been a wonderful series on Psalms. I feel sometimes uh, when I read the book of Psalms that I'm eavesdropping in somebody's prayer and somebody's relationship with the Lord, because it's so personal and it's so genuine. And it, uh, David deals with, with real truths. And when he's hurting or when he's struggling, he says so. And when he's praising God and when he's, he's delighted, he says so. He reveals what he knows about God. And so uh, I can't wait to meet him. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so in this psalm, he actually goes from, you know, from the womb to heaven, basically, and looks, looks back at his life. And the way the psalm is written, it's all this you and me and you and me and you and me and I and you and I and you in just about every, every verse. So you feel the, the closeness, the close relationship between David and the Lord and how... Uh, how intimate uh, they are together. And he begins, uh, and it's interesting because the psalm begins and ends with the same verbs in, at the beginning, but in different forms. At the beginning, it says, you have searched me and you know me. And, uh, and then he says all this stuff that God uh, revealed to him about how he knows him and all the details of his life. And then at the end, he says the same thing, but he says them as commands. Search me and know me. I like what I found out, you know, as you searched me and know me. So keep going. Keep searching and keep, keep digging and keep doing your work in me. And as I was reading this, I thought it almost felt like 
uh, you know, if I applied it to me, I felt like an archaeological project, you know, <laughs> with God digging and sifting and doing all the stuff that you do when you're on, uh, on an archaeological site. And one thing I love here is uh, God searches us, he knows us, he discerns, he observes, he's familiar with us, he hems us in. So it's a constant. It's never, he never blinks, he never takes a break, he never gets frustrated with us. He never, uh, you know, somehow gets flustered, uh, even though he's always uh, close to us and he's always observing us. Always. And I like to do this with people. You know. <laughs> 24 hours a day. You know. Even you wake up in the morning and open one eye. Oh, here it is. <laughs> and, uh, always, always. And what I love is that we often talk about we want to be intimate with God. But God is always intimate with us. Because if he's always there observing us and keeping an eye on us and speaking to us and guiding us, he never gets frustrated. And in the ancient Near East, you have a, a few texts that are texts that talk about creation and uh, the flood. You have the Gilgamesh epic that is mostly about the flood, but Athrahasis, which is another text of, the, of Mesopotamia that talks about the gods uh, a lot of parallels with the creation narrative and the flood story in Genesis. And what you read is that the gods created uh, humankind to serve the gods, to serve the deities. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, but uh, after a while, the, the, the humans don't behave the way the gods like. They make too much noise. They're be becoming a bother. And so in the Mesopotamian story, uh, it says that the deities end up destroying, they, they're tired of humankind. And so they devise a plan to destroy humans through a massive flood. And so the flood takes place and humankind is destroyed. So a lot of parallels with what we read in the biblical text. But one thing that is different is that God never gets frustrated with us. God is not out to get us. And, but the deities were, were, you know, getting discouraged and getting tired of humans and all of this, but we never, never, ever find that with God. God is never tired with us. He's always with us. His presence is always with us. And David talks about uh, God uh, seeking and uh, working in him. In other Psalms also, in Psalm 17, verse 3, we read, you have examined, that's a psalm of David also, you have examined my heart, you search me at night. Though you test me, you find nothing. I resolve that my mouth, with my mouth I will not sin. In Psalm 26 too, David says, probe me, Adonai, and test me. Refine my mind and my heart. So God is always, uh, he's not doing that because he doesn't know everything about us. He's doing that for us so that we respond and we spend time with him. We want to know what he knows about us and we learn from him. And therefore, it causes us to want to change and be more like him. So this psalm, and if you think, I've shared this before, that one of my favorite, uh, favorite verses in scripture is Hebrews 4.13, that no creature is hidden from him, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And I love this. If we live transparent, if we live with no secrets, if we live naked before the Lord, we can live free. And freedom comes first by our relationship with God. If we hide things, if we tr think we can just kind of, well, I'll deal with this later, or you know, whatever comes to mind, whatever God makes us aware of, is really for our good. It's for us to say, I release it, Lord. He already knows it. It's nothing new to him. He's not searching me to find stuff. He's searching me so that he reveals to me who he is, how he's working in me, in all of us. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a, uh, so what does it mean to know someone? 
And one thing we, we read uh, very early in scripture is the use of the verb know that talks about intimacy in Genesis chapter four, verse one, Adam knew Eve and she conceived. So you can see that the just knowing was not an intellectual exercise, but it really was a, a, a life-giving experience. And it was a really close relationship, a close knowing. And this is the same verb that we have here, you know me. And I think if in the situation of Genesis 4, 1, that Adam knew even she conceived, she bore fruit, I think how much more so that God knows me intimately and bears fruit in my life and through my life. And we know the fruit of the Spirit comes from God. We can't muster that up. And so God knows us, and as he knows us, he produces uh, uh, fruit in us. People think they know one another. And I've never been married, so I can't use that as an example for me. But uh, I remember my mother saying, oh, I thought I knew your dad before I married him. And uh, until I married him, and then I found out who he really was. And, uh, and I won't go any further into the discussion we had. And um, so sometimes we know about people, but what does it mean to really know people? And there are many levels of knowing. So even people think they know us sometimes. And, but people may know something about us. But most of us don't know each other at the same level as intimately as we know our close, uh, close friends. Yes, here we are. And, uh, and um, must be the Lord phoning Bob. <laughs> All right, I want to reveal something to you. <laughs> All right, so only God knows us to the deepest parts of our being, knows absolutely everything, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Um, you know, and I remember Rabbi Chaim talking about how our responsibility is, open, is to open every door of our heart to him. And I still remember the picture that I had when he said that. And we sing a song that talks about uh, kol pina, every corner of our hearts, even every corner of our lives. So. Uh, hiding things or thinking, thank you, thank you, thank you, yeah, holy, holy water. <laughs> thank you. All right. Yeah, so God knows absolutely everything about us. So if he does, so why, you know, why bother pray if he already knows everything about us? And prayer and uh, having a, a intimacy with God is not for God's sake, it's for ours. We need to spend time with a God who knows everything about us and who is still compassionate, who is still loving, who is still kind, who is still patient. And um, so I love that, that his part is to know me, he does that perfectly already. But my part is a response in getting to know him, is my part of the relationship that we have together. Now the next verse talks about, um, yeah, even before a word is on my tongue, behold Adonai, you know it all together. Oh, I love that. And when you start talking about the tongue and the lips and the scripture has so much to say about our words. And in ancient times, they didn't have social media, didn't have emails, and so sometimes we think it's only related to the words we speak, but it's any word that comes out of us that is communicated uh, uh, to whosoever the recipient may be. Uh, and it reflects on what is in our heart. Yeshua in Matthew 15 says, don't you grasp that whatsoever goes into the mouth passes through the stomach, then is ejected into the sewer. But the thing that proceeds out of the mouth comes forth from the heart. And those things make the man unholy if they are not the types of things that God, the words that God wants us to speak or that please him. So sometimes when we, and I, you know, I'm sure nobody else here has done that, but written emails that you think, oh darn, shouldn't have written that so much. <laughs> I shouldn't have clicked the, the send button or uh, said a few things that I shouldn't have said. Or, uh, um, 
Yeah, so I think we all do. So, so I think the idea of learning to interrupt the, the conversation even in our minds before it goes out, whether it's in writing or in spoken form, and to really, because uh, God knows those words anyways, and God, God knows every word we speak and every word we don't speak. Rabbi uh, Randy Shapiro, who is a good friend of Rabbi Chaim, was here for, uh, for the memorial service. And he said to me, uh, he's been ill all his life. He's been in the hospital a lot. And he said, I remember when I was in the hospital, I was intubated and I couldn't speak. He said a lot of words, and he's an extrovert of extroverts, you know. So he would have loved to speak, but he couldn't communicate. And he said to me, uh, I could not speak, but yet I had a lot of words going on in my mind. I could not speak them, but God heard them. And so I thought he was able to talk to the Lord, you know, just by the processing of the thoughts in his mind. So God knew every word. And he would have said them out loud, I'm sure, if he hadn't been intubated, because he's, uh, he's just an amazing uh, preacher of the gospel, evangelist. I flew back from the conference in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale with him uh, about six weeks ago. Uh, he sat by the aisle, I sat by the window, and this lady between us, I mean, she, she heard the gospel, she responded well to the gospel. They're now the best of friends, and, uh, and they're communicating with each other, and he prayed for her, and she helped him, and, and it was just wonderful to hear just all the, the love of God coming out of him uh, and being shared with this woman. Now, if you want a good place to look for what God says about words, Proverbs is full of Proverbs about the tongue and the lips and the words and the mouth. A few of them, uh, in Proverbs 14 says, In the mouth of a fool is a rod for his back, but the lips of the wise protect them. Proverbs 15, 2. The tongue of the wise treats knowledge correctly, but the mouth of fools spout folly. Proverbs 15, 28, a righteous heart thinks before answering, but a wicked mouth blurts out evil. Proverbs 16, 23, a wise man's heart teaches his mouth and adds persuasiveness to his lips. And then the one I like the best is in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 28. It reads, even a fool who keeps quiet is considered wise, discerning if he seals his lips. I think you can be a fool and God gives you a way to look smart. <laughs> and just keep your mouth shut and he'll, he'll look good. And in the New Testament, in the book of James, we have a passage that's uh, very uh, clear on this matter, starting in chapter 3. For we all stumble in many ways. If someone does not stumble in speech, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. And if we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey, we guide their whole body as well. See also the ships, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. See how a so small a fire set ablaze, so great a forest. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of evil placed among our body parts. It pollutes the whole body and sets on fire the course of life and is set on fire by Gehenna. For every species on be of beasts and birds, reptiles, sea creatures is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can, can tame the tongue. It, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless Adonai and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the image of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be. And so, very clearly it's stated for us, and I have a friend who was head of a ministry years ago, I remember her saying, oh, I wish I could rip the book of James out of the Bible. <laughs> Because she was an extrovert of extrovert and often found herself with chapter 3 totally convicted. And uh, so, uh, yeah, God, you know, the word of God is very practical. So even here, David says, even before a word is on my tongue, you know it. 
So even when I'm thinking it, you know it. And so you know all about it. And then he talks about, uh, you have laid your hand upon me. You hem me in before and behind. And I've talked about that before, how's a hem? You know, if you're stuck in the middle of the hem, uh, then you're completely surrounded. And actually the word that is used here is the same word that you find for to besiege a city. And most of the time in scripture, it's a negative uh, connotation that goes with that word, that it surrounds a city because the enemy is surrounding the city and therefore you have no place to go. But here in this context, the word is redeemed and it talks about how I am hemmed in by you. You are before and uh, behind me. And uh, so you have laid your hand upon me. So I love, uh, here it, it kind of pivots, you know, from you, 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 to uh, uh, David all says, okay, now I, uh, you know, all that stuff that I found out about you, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's beyond what I can grasp. And I think we need to remain that way, to remain humble, that we'll never figure out completely uh, who God is, how he works. I was, uh, when I was in the pastorate in Canada, I was in the word faith movement, the name it and claim it for a while. I survived it. And, uh, <laughs> but the idea was, oh, if you say this, then God's going to do this. It's as if you had God figured out. And if you spoke it, God was going to do this. And so, uh, you know, I, I, left the movement, found out that God's much beyond what I can say or think or, or manipulate out of him. Um, so it, when uh, the scripture, David says, you have laid your hand upon me, your hand. And if you think of the hand of God, I, I love what uh, the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 40. He says, um, who has measured the waters in the palm of his hand? and measured out heaven with a span. So all of creation is in the span of God's hand. How big is God's hand? And all the oceans are all in the palm right here. So you can run all your life towards the edge and you'll never make it. Never make it out of his hand because his hand is too big. And his hand is under us, upholds us, and his hand is, uh, is upon us also. So we are hemmed in uh, by his hand being on our life. So David had the, the awareness that God was always with him, always observing him, always watching him. Uh, and it, I think it, it's uh, sometimes convicting when, when we do things we ought not do or say things we ought not say, that uh, it brings us to conviction faster if we know that God is right there. You know, I, I was driving this morning uh, on Gun Club on my way here. It's a 55 zone, and the person in front of me decided that it was a 40 zone. And uh, so I had a few thoughts. <laughs> and then I remember that the Lord knows all my thoughts. <laughs> and so I kind of chuckled by myself, you know, saying, yes, Lord, okay, I'm okay, no problem. 40 will make it there. <laughs> And, but very aware that God knows, knew exactly what I was thinking at that moment. And then the psalmist, David, says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Impossible. If I go up, you're there. If I go down, you're there. If I go to heaven, you're there. If I go to uh, Sheol, you're there. You're always there. Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah also uh, uh, reveals wor the, what God says to him. Can anyone hide in places so secret that I will not see him? Do I not feel heaven and earth? It is a declaration of Adonai. Nobody can hide from God. Whether we are walking with God, not walking with God, absolutely every human being on the face of the earth is being watched. <laughs> Constantly. 24 hours a day. And as we pray for the people who need, now, now our rabbi is, is in good shape, and, uh, <laughs> but as we pray for people who don't know the Lord, the Lord is watching these people, and he cares for these people. And I believe that the Lord reveals his compassion and, and responds with compassion with whatever they need to be brought to him. And so God doesn't watch the people who love him, walk with him more, then he watches everybody else. 
Everyone is created in the image of God, and God loves absolutely everyone, no matter what their lifestyle is, no matter what their background is. Uh, God's love is no different from the believer than what uh, from the, for the unbeliever than what it is for the believer. It is beyond what our mind can comprehend. The compassion, the love, the the presence of God. You know, sometimes we we uh, read. I think Brother Lawrence has a book that talks about practicing the presence of God, and so that's us uh, wanting to spend time with God. Well, God always practices pres his presence with us. I mean, he doesn't need to read a book to do it. <laughs> I mean, God is always practicing his presence uh, with us. So where can I go from the Lord? Nowhere. No one can hide. And we read he never leaves us, never forsakes us. Doesn't matter what we go through in life, never leaves. Calvin commentary says, God's eye penetrates heaven and hell. And hell. So it doesn't matter where we find ourselves in life. God is as close, as close as we can ever have God close to us. He never leaves us. If sometimes we live by feelings. You know, I don't feel like God's present. I don't feel like God is close. Uh, but it's not about feelings. It's about what the reality of what God is saying in his word, that he never leaves us, never forsakes us, that he knows everything about us, he searches us, he observes us. He, And then verse 10 talks about he holds us by the hand. Yeah, he holds us by the hand, and the verb that is there is achaz. So it's not just he takes us by the hand, you know, like uh, uh, two friends or a child and a parent, and, and he holds, achaz is to grasp. You know, try to get out of God's grasp, impossible. He holds us by the hand, and he never gets sweaty palms, and he never lets us slip just when we do something. He holds us by the hand. And I was thinking of an example that Rabbi David shared with us the other day of when his mother, when he was young, his mother had a harness so he wouldn't go too far. You know, and I was thinking, yeah, yeah, there's a harness. And it's not, the, it's not a, a collar around the neck where God <laughs> yanks us, you know. I, and I do that with my dogs. I don't uh, hook uh, the, 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 the uh, yeah, the choker, choke collar. I don't hook the, 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 the leash on the choke collar because I know that I could, uh, I could hurt them. But I bought the, the harnesses that keep them comfortable. And so the hook is in the middle, and I don't let go. And so I see God as, you know, go for it, Lord. And uh, <laughs> just make sure it's nice and secure. And uh, God holds us, and he grasps us. He's got us in his harness. And Paul said in Romans 8, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor debts, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Messiah Yeshua our Lord. Impossible to be separated from God. So we need to live in such a way that we recognize that I am totally hooked up to God. I'm totally linked to to God. I'm harnessed to him. In Psalm 121, uh, the psalmist says that he is the shadow at my right hand. And I think you can never outrun your shadow. And so you can run, you can try to hide, but your shadow is always part of you or always attached to you. Psalm 23 ends with, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I love it. Wherever you go in life, surely goodness and mercy are hanging on and running with you, you know, and following you. And goodness and mercy come from the Lord. So, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So anyone who has, uh, you know, any, any desire to serve God, uh, you know, can totally surrender to God and trust God that God will lead, that God will take care of things, that God will, will uh, direct in the right direction. He will 
orchestrate our lives. He will order our steps in the wrong, in the wrong, I mean, the right direction. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and I think that uh, if e everyone here can look back at how faithful God has been in their lives, and the more you look, the older you get, the longer you've got in, in uh, how God has been faithful to you. And so the more secure I feel that uh, he has been so faithful for so long in so many ways, when I tried to do my own thing, that God was always faithful to, to yank the leash a bit, you know, and uh, bring me back in line and uh, show me that he loved me. God is... Uh, trying to get away from God really is a waste of time. And anyone who tries to get away from God is because they don't understand how close God is, how much God cares, how much God loves. God is compassionate. He's not out to get us. So if he's that close to us, always with us, always watching over us, is to express his love. He's long-suffering. He's very patient. And he waits until we get over ourselves and then keeps working uh, with us. We go through all kinds of things in life, but God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's faithful. He's compassionate. It doesn't change. We change. You know, we grow. We have our ups and downs, but God is always compassionate, always long-suffering, always merciful. Uh, uh, Jeremiah in Lamentation says, This I recall to my heart, therefore I have hope. Because of the mercies of Adonai, we will not be consumed. And there are times in our life where his compassions never fail. And I look at, look at my life and some of the things I've done in the past and, and crazy th decisions that I made that could have, you know, cost me my life in some cases. And, uh, but because of the mercies of Adonai, I was not consumed. I was not, his compassion was there, and he brought me back in love. And it's only later that you look back and you see what he's done. It's usually not on the spot. So it's always good to share our testimonies, because I find that sharing my testimony of how God has worked in my life encourages me, because I realize it encourages others also, but it, it reminds me of how wonderful God is. In verses 11 and 12, it says, Surely darkness covers me. Night keeps light at a distance from me. Even darkness is not dark for you, and night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are, the li are, the, are alike. And so there are times in life where we go through dark spells, dark spots, difficult things, and, but God is no different in our dark moments than what he is in our light moments. And uh, I have a sister, I think I've shared this before, who is bipolar, and all her life she's gone through a lot of very difficult things, ups and downs, and, and uh, cycles of, of medication working and not working. And so I've seen her in very dark places, very dark times. And I remember one time that she was really not doing well, so I decided to fly up to Ottawa and go spend time with her. And um, she shared with me, and there are times she had been suicidal, and she had the phone number of who to phone, the suicidal line of, uh, um, but one time when I was there, she said, you know, I was so bad that I wanted to commit suicide, and I knew exactly where in my house I was going to hang the rope, and she had the rope. And so I left before leaving for the airport. I said, well, can I take the rope with me? And so I did. I cried all the way to the airport and threw the rope in the trash. But that was a dark, dark place. I can't relate to that kind of darkness and pain that she was in. She's doing well now. She's, you know, it's part of the ups and downs. I pray for her. I've agonized at times, Lord, please reveal yourself to her. But, uh, but the darkness that, of what I saw at that time was, was very painful. So, so uh, David is not, is not hiding the fact that life has dark places and places when things are going well. Uh, so he says, you know, even there, you're there because you're not different in the light or the darkness. You're the same, and you, you uh, go deep uh, in, uh, in our lives. 
for you have created my conscience. You knit me in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows very well. And we live in a world where, you know, I'm wonderfully made, you know. It's almost like a narcissistic, uh, uh, we're bombarded by the, the beauty uh, has to, to do with, you know, the outward uh, appearance. And I thought, you know, what is David really saying? Saying it's beyond me how, uh, how we are created and how we are formed and how we become who we are. And so I decided to look a little bit in, um, in, uh, in creatures that God has made and how they evolved. You know, I thought, okay, I'm not uh, into biology. I've never done really well in sciences, but there's a lot of fun information out there. And so I started looking at uh, the consistency of uh, the gestation period for different creatures and the consistency of what uh, cr is created, what is formed first and next, and the order of things. And it's fascinating that, you know, each uh, category of animals and birds and, and uh, as humans, there's a real order, and only God created that order for things to evolve this way. And so I, I found that um, mice just stayed about 20 days. That's why they are all over the place. <laughs> and uh, hamsters, 16 to 20 days. So if you have uh, two hamsters, uh, watch out. Uh, rabbits, one month. So why do we have a lot of rabbits out there who eat our, our uh, lettuce? Baboons, a little more than six months. I'm sure you all wondered about that. Uh, donkeys, 12 months uh, it takes. An elephant remains in the womb for almost two years. That's why we don't have a lot of elephants in our gardens. <laughs> but humans, of course, we know it's nine months. So for each, and it's been consistent for each of these categories and their whole list. And what is formed first? Is it the heart, the eyes, the kidneys, the... You know, it's, well, we have somebody who can talk to us more about the biological side of things. But, um, uh, but it's consistent because God ordained it to be this way. And so the psalmist is saying, wow, it's, you, you know, only you could have created something so magnificent as, uh, as creatures, living creatures. And I found out that there are a hundred and trillion cells in the human body with... 200 cell types, apparently. So do you want to know what 100 trillion cell looks like? Look at your neighbor. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Blob of cells. 100 trillion of them. Only God could have done that. Only God could have orchestrated. And then you think of the trillions and quadrillions and zillions of people who have been on the face of the earth since the beginning of times. And no two people alike. No two people exactly the same. And you think, wow, you know. And, and that, that God is aware of each one. Now, if you think there are 7 billion people on the face of the earth right now, with each one, God is. <laughs> you know, 24 hours a day knows all your thoughts. <laughs> all your ways, all your everything. And, uh, and I think, wow, I can't even figure my own thoughts, you know. <laughs> and it's just me. And uh, what goes on in my own brains, I get confused. And, but I think, what a God we have. What a God we serve. What a God we know and who knows us. Individual DNA for people. No, no two people are identical. And so uh, the psalmist says, how precious are your thoughts towards me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grain of sand. And I think, oh, God likes to think about me all the time. He, God is just thinking about me. But he's also thinking about you. And he's thinking about everybody. And his thoughts about me, I think, well, you know, sometimes we act like God, you know, we kind of bother him when we pray. Uh, Hello, I'm here. And, uh, but no, I mean, he is always thinking about each one of us individually. 
and with abundance of thoughts that are more than the grains of the sand. It's beyond what our mind can comprehend, and that's what the psalmist says. So, and then the psalmist says, I hate those who, who hate you. I hate your enemies. I, you know, I, I have a really hard time with them. And I was talking with one of my colleagues this week about this passage and, and about especially this portion that seems to be so negative in the middle of this whole wonderfulness of who God is, what God knows, what God does for each one of us. And it's as if there's this contrast of anyone who tries to take me away from knowing God to that extent and to, to discover the things that God wants me to discover, anyone who tries to take me away from that, I hate. I want nothing to do with them. And so the psalmist is really saying, okay, there are some people who don't like uh, God, who don't like to know about God, who don't like to others to talk about God. And any of those people, he says, I hate in the sense that I want nothing to do with them. Lord, cast them out. You know, we know there are times we read, oh, break the, the teeth of the ungodly, you know, those beautiful uh, passages. And, um, but they're an expression of, you know, I can't take it when people come to me and try to tell me there's no God and that God doesn't exist. And what am I doing serving a, a God who's not there? And he says, no, that, that I want nothing to do uh, with that part. So then he ends the, the, uh, the psalm with, search me. I love what I've discovered as you've searched me. You're show, you've shown to me that you know absolutely everything about me, that you love me, you're compassionate, you know my thoughts, you know my words, and so keep doing it. Search me and know my heart. Examine me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive ways in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In other words, David is saying, wow, it's amazing what I've discovered. Keep doing it. Keep at it. Here I am naked before God. And because God knows everything. So in closing, before uh, James comes to uh, recite the ironic blessing over us, I would like for us to just close your eyes. I don't want words on the PowerPoint, but the song that was played earlier on Psalm 139. And Think about it for yourself. Close your eyes and just let the Lord speak to you. Make my bed in the day. 
depths of the sea You are there If I rise on the wings of the dawn If I settle on distant shores Even there Your hand will guide me Even there Your right hand will hold me fast How precious to me are your thoughts how vast the sum of them If I were to count them They'd number far more than the sand How precious to me are your thoughts How vast the sum of them Far too great for me to ever understand So search me, search me, oh God And know my heart, try me And know my thoughts And see if there be in me Any wicked way Then lead me down of the sea you are there if I rise on the wings of the dawn if I settle on distant shores even there your hand will guide me even there your right hand will hold me fast your right hand will hold God commanded Moses and Aaron to put his name on the children of Israel with this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face toward you and give you his shalom. The name of Yeshua, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>